thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Um, we, um, you had reached out to me, which is sort of my favorite versions of podcasts when somebody reaches out to me to want to talk about something. Um, and it was in the context of the recent Supreme Court rulings around Roe v. Wade. Um, and uh, before we get into sort of any you know, nitty gritty here. Um, I do just want to sort of put a, a couple of things out here that like, I'm not looking to change your mind on anything necessarily. Um, and I, and I hope that you're not looking to change my mind. Like, I feel like what I want to do here is understand your viewpoint a little bit better. And I hope that you, that's a mutual goal of yours. Um, and, and it seems, you know, we had a, con we had a nice conversation about a week ago. Um, and it really felt like that was your in, your intention um, there. So I think that's for anybody who's listening to that to this. Uh, there's a real sense online that everybody's trying to change everybody's mind, and I think that's something that I've learned that I, especially with this podcast, that I just generally can't do. Um, and I found it kind of fruitless to feel like that's the goal. Um, for me, the goal is to be like, all right, now I understand why you think what you think. Um, how can we? How do we go from there? You know what I mean? And I, and I would say this is true w with any societal issue, gun violence, abortion, murder, like, you know, uh, uh, robbery, whatever, whatever the issue is, um, those sort of police violence, whatever it is, I, I feel like those, for me, for my mental health, that's the way I have to approach this stuff or I just lose my mind. Um, so does that feel like an okay place to sort of launch off from? Yeah, hundred percent. And that's, that's like why I reached out to you in the first place was because I could tell that you were eager for honest and respectful dialogue with people who disagreed you with you. You were asking for people to message you and to like, because you're tired of these sort of fruitless um, bickering conversation, you know, not even really conversations going on. And so I could tell that you're a smart, a smart guy with that's strong in your viewpoints. And that I think a conversation like this is, good for people, not only for us, but for people listening to get different perspectives and see how they, how they um, work when you compare, contrast them. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking to understand your viewpoint better and have a great respectful conversation. That's good for both of us. Well, and one of the things too, that I want to, um, you know, we're not, I'm not going to uh, lean on too much here, but one of the things too, that drives me a little bonkers about just society in general is this feeling that you know, because you're a musician, you must think one way, or because you're a truck driver, you must think this way. Like, you know, I, I genuinely believe that stereotypes do exist. Often there's a kernel of some truth in there as to why that exists. Often, though, it's way off base. And I have found in my time, it's like, you are, you're a college, you're, you're graduated now, is that right? Yes, just graduated yeah. this past year. But you're in the scene that I'm in and you play weird music and you studied for mallet marimba and your friend is giving snare drum lessons in the background. Like, yeah. <laughs> so you're a music nerd, just like I am in, in that's where our Venn diagram here overlaps. And, yeah. um, I, I want to sort of dis dispel the myth that like, we all think the same. Um, okay, well let's move forward here. Um, uh, actually, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself? You, you mentioned that you, you actually, one of the first things you said to me was that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you're a reformed Calvinist. I think I know what the first one means. What does the second one mean to you? And like, just for some, again, like I grew up in the Lutheran church. I was raised Catholic, grew up in the Lutheran church. Um, my wife is an ELCA pastor, um, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, fairly progressive wing of the Lutheran church. And the fact that she's a pastor at all, it, it indicates that she's in a sort of more progressive uh, area of religion. But for you, what, is a, what does a reformed Calvinist even mean? Talk to me like I'm two. Sure. So um, Reformed Calvinism, and I'm honestly relatively new to it. I've really only prescribed to that view for, um, or a certain type of that view for the past year and a half or so. I would say for me, it revolves around um, what people call the doctrines of grace. Um, you call it tulip. Um, some people call it tulip. It's total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, um, uh oh, <laughs> limited atonement. You're uh, you're <laughs> no. It's fine. Listen, man, I'm bad with acronyms too. Don't hang on. I forgot the freaking acronym. Uh, the last one is perseverance of the saints. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
Oh yeah, irresistible grace. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. And <laughs> and yeah, so it's a uh, view about the an interpretation of scripture that basically revolves around the sovereignty of God, and um, a big uh, debate in the community of Christians is predestination, and Calvinists hold that God is completely sovereign and that everything that um, happens in life is determined from before uh, the foundation of the world. And that doesn't mean that we can't make choices or aren't morally responsible for our actions, but it means that nothing bad that happens, for example, is meaningless. It all has ultimate meaning and that God will ultimately bring everything together for his good purpose at the end of time. Um, for example, with the story of Joseph in Genesis, he says, um, what you meant for evil, what the brothers meant for evil by s selling Joseph into slavery, I meant for good. And so you have someone meaning something for evil, but at the same exact time, God means it for good. Um, and that applies to everything that happens, including um, who is saved, who is not saved, how does one come to salvation. Um, uh, Reformed Calvinists typically believe that someone comes to salvation because God gives them salvation and it doesn't have anything to do um, with their own. Uh, it does have to do with their own choice, but in a much more real way, they would never have come to Christ if God didn't put uh, the Holy Spirit in them to draw them to him first. Um, and then other groups like Arminians would believe, which who I love and who I are uh, just as much Christian as I am. I'm actually wearing a Wesleyan <laughs> hat right now, and they're, uh, which they're not Reformed Calvinists, mm -hmm. but they they believe that um, that the person initiates the relationship with God, and that I, it rests on the choice of the individual of whether or not they accept. Jesus Christ um, in a much more, uh, in, a, in, in a different way. So getting into the weeds here, sorry, but how do you come to salvation, the view of, of God's sovereignty, uh, predestination, things like that? Okay. Um, I mean, one of the, so a couple of things that as you were talking, sort of like there were some bells going off of like, okay, that's, I've, I've heard that before in the, you know, in terms of my religious upbringing um, in the TULIP, acronym that you laid out one of the things that like irresistible grace um that is something that as far as my wife and again like i for anybody listening to this, i don't want i am trying my best not to speak on behalf of my wife who is a lutheran pastor she is way more knowledgeable in this she went to seminary at union theological she studied with cornell west like she's she oh, is wow. she's no joke and she's you know so i don't want to i don't even want to presume to try to speak for her what i'm speaking on behalf of is my sort of sidecar relationship and just sort of I'm the guy with a little white helmet riding along with her to everything yeah. and listening to the conversations grace is something that comes up in the Lutheran church almost first um, in my in my experience and that is something that's really interesting to me um, raised as a Catholic grace is something that you sort of I'm just going to say the dumb thing like you bought like the indulgences, right? Like you bought your way or you bought your forgiveness or you had to go into, I mean, I remember as a kid going to confessional for the first time, you know, I sat down with this very old man and he was just like, what have you done, son? And I was like, I stole tennis balls from the high school tennis team while they were practicing and they didn't know it. And he's like, mm -hmm. 10 Hail Marys. And I was like, what? He's like, mm -hmm. that's it. I was like, well, that was, that was pretty easy. Right. I'm going to go take some more tennis balls, right. you know, you know, I, whatever. I was a young and immature kid. Like I, yeah. I didn't. So, but when I met my wife, she started talking about this thing of, of grace yeah. being something that you have by default, you are automatically forgiven because you're a sinner, you're a mess. <laughs> so um, to me, that that's an, just an interesting thing. I want to sort of plug together here as you, as Calvinists see grace, um, because I think this does relate to how, abortion, how we legislate stuff. This is sort of how we ended our conversation last time. Of like, if we live in a free society um, where everybody can pick and choose what it is that they, what gets them out of bed in the morning? What is the thing that drives them to practice drums, to care for the homeless person? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Everybody has the right to decide for themselves what that is. Um, how we then legislate in a society 
to protect, support, and all of those things is where the, that rubber meets the road. And I'm sensing a lot of the tension here and a lot of the fear from the left um, and the misperceptions of that fear from the right. Um, as far as grace is concerned in Calvinism, though, uh, I've understood grace, in at least in the Lutheran Church, to be like your it's default. So like we, that's where we start. Is the is grace in the Calvinist sort of tradition something that's also by default, or is there like how does how do you all view it? Mm-hmm. So grace is something that is applied to those who have faith in Jesus Christ specifically, um, and so. You, you don't just, uh, for the Reformed Calvinist view, you don't just receive grace because um, you're a sinner. You need grace because you're a sinner, but you only get grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's called, and grace is something that's undeserved. And so someone only comes to faith in Jesus Christ because faith, Ephesians 2 8 says that faith is a gift from God and it's not of work so that no man shall boast. And so, um, not everyone receives grace um, and not not everyone goes to heaven or goes to be with God. That's a sort of more universalist view. And so the L limited atonement is one of the more controversial points. It's that mm-hmm. Jesus came for a specific group of people. Like in John 10, he says, I came for my sheep. And he's talking to the Pharisees and he says, you're not of, you don't believe the words I'm saying, you don't have faith in me, for example, because you're not my sheep. And so he comes for um, his people and those who have faith in Christ are his people. And those are the ones who receive grace, not every single person. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. It makes total sense. I'm trying to figure out. Um, I disagree. <laughs> I'm trying to figure yeah. out, you know, I, I mean, I'm of- not, I'm trying and, to figure and, out how, like, I understand, sorry, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but like. No, you're good. And I have friends that I are just as dedicated to Christ as me who take different a different view. And so that's not a, necess, that's not a necessary or essential truth to be mm-hmm. a Christian. That's just the denomination or the interpretation that I find to be the most biblically accurate. Got it. Okay. Um, the, where we kind of left off the last time was sort of how, where, then the like the the word interpretation has come up several times, um, and by default, interpretation is an interpretation. You've read something that was written two thousand years ago um, by several different people who all had their own interpretation of what they were seeing. Um, and I admit I haven't read the entire Bible cover to cover. I haven't even read all the different versions of the Bible cover to cover. But um, it does strike me sometimes that. The, like stories aren't necessarily 100% consistent throughout the Bible um, in terms of what is being said, how things are reported, who was at certain events. Um, and so to me, that the interpretation thing is where I feel like as it reaches society where we get a little stuck. Um, and I'm curious, how does that interpretation uh, in, in how that manifests into legislative morality, I guess, is the issue. Um, Within the constructs of religion, thou shalt not murder is sort of like, or thou shalt not kill, not murder. Uh, kill is the like one of the primary things you're taught from day one, right? Um, I believe it is murder. Is it murder? Yeah. Because killing that, is, is sometimes necessary. And that, yeah, and that's open to interpretation yeah. too. But, 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 but the, well, and, and yeah. I don't disagree with you fundamentally, <laughs> but it's, you know, I think if you talk to Putin, he thinks killing is necessary in Ukraine to get across a colonial, you know, anyway, we can go down that rabbit hole, but yeah, like, we can. Yeah. you know, that there it's been misused in, in, in the past. And so like, as it pertains to abortion specifically, um, what I often hear from religious folks is you're a baby killer. Uh, and I'm going to use the most extreme example of, you know, like the guy who went and shot an abortion doctor in the, in the head in a church. Like there's a, there was a weird contract he made with his belief that like he was so upset that these babies are being killed that he justified killing a doctor. Mm -hmm. I could understand if I lived my entire life with that belief system and how that would like, if someone was telling me every day that there were babies being killed, I could understand why that would gin me up to the point where like, fuck, I gotta go. I gotta save these babies. You know, the problem is, is you killed somebody. Mm-hmm. And like, like, and everybody gets freaked out. And so like, I'm curious 
where do you see the misalignments of how religion has played poorly for your argument? Not your specific argument, but mm -hmm. the, the argument from the right of, or from the religious right of like, yeah. you, these are babies, these are innocent lives. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel that your argument is actually being hurt um, sometimes by people on your side? Because m the people reaching out to me aren't crazy people. They're people like you who don't want to go shoot doctors, I'm guessing. <laughs> you know, I don't, right. it doesn't strike me that that's how you want to live your life. Nailed um, it, yeah. So I guess for me, that's, that's what, one of my main questions. How do you, what frustrates you about your side of the argument? Sure. Um, well, you can point to many, many times in history, the Crusades, people using the Bible to justify slavery. Um, this person who shot an abortion doctor in, in the head. And, you know, one of my favorite things I've heard about this topic is the people who are driving people away from Christianity the most are not atheists. They are Christians um, uh, or, or so-called Christians, let's say, who are using and abusing the holy word of the living God for their own sinful purposes. And so, that would be a perfect example of that. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no one, there's nothing anywhere in the Bible that anyone could show me that would justify what that guy did. Um, there are, I do believe that capital punishment is a biblical uh, concept. I don't think that that's ambiguous in any way when you look at the Bible, but it's a legal process. It's not something that you can just go and do yourself. Um, so, uh, anyone who takes things out of context, you, you mentioned earlier that the Bible was, I mean, it was written thousands of years ago in a specific context in a specific day, and it has to be read with that context in mind. And when you don't do that, or, and you just look at Revelation, which is apocalyptic literature, which means it's written to specifically to hide certain messages at that time from the Roman officials. When you look at that and you just take a verse out of context, and you can use it to start the Davidian cult that led to the, um, um, I forget which uh, horror, tragedy it happened in. Wake, in, in, in Waco, Texas. The in Waco, yeah, yeah, Waco. Um, you can use that and convince people to do all sorts of horrible things when you don't take it in context. Because Revelation, the way you unlock the keys of Revelation is by knowing the rest of the Bible. Most of Revelation is quotes from the rest of the Bible. So, um Long answer short, just anyone who takes things out of context and uses it to promote their own sinful purposes or doesn't or makes an argument based off a couple of verses and doesn't, you know, talk about the gospel, doesn't talk about Jesus Christ, doesn't talk about how um, salvation is for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, doesn't talk about how there's forgiveness in Christ for for people who have had abortions, for people who have uh, murdered, for for anyone who comes to Jesus Christ for forgiveness they they will receive it if they truly come and if they truly want to be saved from their sins so that's what christianity is about is a gospel and so anyone who is non-gospel oriented and is all about um inflicting their own morality or their own justice on the world they are worse with a christian movement than any atheist i would say so yeah i mean i, I appreciate that answer and it's it's uh, you know i think of i mean there's people who take the, the one mention of of homosexuality out of in Leviticus and base their entire worldview on that in terms of gay marriage there's people who take the quote of you know talking about using your children are as are arrows in your quiver um, take that and and you know you're then then you're Warren Jeffs with the FLDS or what um, maybe I'm getting the acronym there wrong you know mm -hmm. to me I think you uh, Seeing things in the con the, the context in which they're written is something that my wife is very interested in. Um, the Leviticus quote, for example, and I'm not I'm going to bumble this I'm going to I'm going to bungle this horribly, but in the context of that time, there w there was a serious hierarchy of man, woman, beast, and to put a man on the same level as a woman or was was an insult. Like it was not a, like it was gross or you're going to, you know, it's disgusting and we don't think that's cool. Like it was just a, it's a societal hierarchy thing at that time. And how then we've moved forward now, 2000 years later, things are just different. We don't necessarily see men and women in that hierarchy anymore. So to use that quote 
out of context and apply it to today's standards is troublesome to me. Yeah. In the same way yeah. that the quiverful full arrows thing is just like, no, I get what you're saying, because back in those days, you're a tribe of 100 people, you know? And so if you lost two of those, like you just lost 2% of your tribe, like that's a lot of people. And you know, we lost a million people during, to the pandemic. You know, that's a lot of people. But relative to a 100-person tribe, like I could understand why you would have those views. It's like, oh my God, we got we to gotta keep making babies we're not necessarily in that exact context anymore. So how do you view taking the Bible in its original context, like like a constitutional originalist, you know? This is the other issue for me is like Clarence Thomas talking about the constitutional originality of like the way things were written in 1776. It's like, all right, um, you want to go down that road? Like, let's do that because you wouldn't be a Supreme Court justice if you really wanted to see the world the way the, the constitutional writers saw the world, you know? So sure. how, do you, how do you see things in the Bible in context, and then how do you apply it to today's context in which you walk into a grocery store and you've got to meet, you know, you're not talking to a woman from, you know, the year two. She's, she's in 2022 and she sees the world differently than think people did then. How do you adjust that context for yourself? Sure. Well, we can look at the Old Testament law, for example. I figured we're going to end up there uh, at some point or another anyways, but so like one example is there's a law in, in the uh, Torah about having a parapet or a fence around the roof of your house and how that's actually a, a law. Mm-hmm. Um, because in those days, people would go on top of their roofs to hang out or cool off or something like that. And it, you had to protect the people who are up there, your neighbors that were maybe up there from falling off and dying. Mm-hmm. And so we would look at that and say, OK, there's a general equity for that law. And we can apply that today. Like, okay, maybe if you are having, this is not, uh, you know, set, this is not like me saying we should legislate this, but just for example, like you should scrape the ice off of your driveway when people come up to your house in the winter mm-hmm. and you're living in somewhere cold. Like you take the general equity of that and apply it to today. Um, with the uh, men and women uh, issue that you raised, I think that what men do in that society and what women do in that society is different from um, how we live today. But at the same time, there's a general equity of, of that that still applies to today. Like, um, you know, you know, people often look at verses like wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives like the like Christ loves the church and say, that's inequality. Um, but when you look at some, when you look at the broad scope of the Bible and what it teaches, it teaches that men and women do play different roles um, and they are better at dip, doing different things. Like women are naturally inclined to have children and to nurture children. Men are generally inclined to go and fight wars and to be the physical protector of their family and to be the spiritual leader of their family. These are ideas that today's culture definitely does not enjoy, by the way, but that's not inequality because um, when you look at the Trinity and you look at the father and you have the son and the son submits in everything to the father, anything that he sees the father doing, he does. And that doesn't mean that he's less than the father Jesus said, I and the father are one. They're equal. They just serve different roles. And so um, that's the same thing with men and women. And so you can take the broad biblical teaching in the context of the day. And you can say, oh, this is how they, they dealt with this biblical truth in that society. And then we can look at the Bible and say, this is how we should deal with it in our society today. And so it's, um, and, you know, we haven't even talked about going into the, the moral law versus ceremonial law versus civil or judicial law and how to interpret that and how there's actually disagreements, large disagreements within the Christian Christian community about specific, specifically the civil law and how to apply that to today. Um, things like the ceremonial law being fulfilled in Christ, the ceremonies of like sacrifices and, um, you know, how to commune with God through sacrifices, um, how that's no longer needed because that was fulfilled in Christ because Christ is the once for all sacrifice. And so those, you know, 
people often accuse Christians of picking and choosing from the Old Testament law. And I would say, well, we are picking and choosing because we're supposed to pick and choose because there are certain laws that have been fulfilled in Christ and we wouldn't want to apply them today because if we did, then we'd, we'd basically be acting as if Jesus never did what he did. And then there's things like the moral law, which still apply. Well, can I, sorry, let me just, sorry to interrupt. Sure, but like sure. In terms of the, uh, like the agency, the agency that you have to pick and choose which of the laws apply today or which of the laws we want to sort of adjust for today. Um, I think I just want to, I just want to call out that like, I think the per, there's a perception from the left that that agency is without question that like that, that agency only exists on the right. And then when someone on the left says, you know, that that law that you are trying to adjust for today is actually counter to my entire belief system. So by you, by, I keep pointing at you, but like by, by the right or the religious right, um, deciding for themselves that this is a thing. And I have no say, I don't have agency over that because I haven't accepted Christ or whatever it is, the view, uh, that, that, that the other party has as to why I don't have agency. Like, I think I just want, this is, this to me is why the argument fails so much from the right and why the left is always left being like in women and not all women but like like my wife for example is just left being like you know I'm a pastor too and you just you all just decided this thing and now and you're going whole hog on it if I was going to pick and choose like there's a you know one of the first things I got off when I got off the chat with you the other day I mentioned I was talking to my wife and she's like who are you talking to I was like oh this nice guy David and we were talking and she's and because she's a pastor and she she has like these things at the at the drop. She she's like numbers, and I was like, "What?" She's like numbers. I was like, "Okay, well, I, uh, tell me more. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I know that that's a book numbers this week. <laughs> you know, and there's a passage in there about a, a particular procedure that was done. Yep, numbers a, five. If a man um, suspects his wife of adultery, he can go to a priest, who will make an herbal cocktail. Um, I don't think I don't know if the recipe is in there or not, but it's an herbal cocktail that if the woman is pregnant, she will miscarry, and it will be proof that she's an adulterer. Thus, she can be sentenced to death. If she doesn't miscarry, it's proof that she's not an adulterer, and they can. It's like a like, like a. I read that and I was like, well, that sounds like the witch test from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Throw her in the water, and if she drowns, she's not a witch. You know, like you know. I'm just like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I think. To me, that's a big one. That um, if the agency, the agency to sort of decide that that doesn't apply today, or that that's not a an option for women, yeah, um, or or to, or just to let, let's put it in the context, that is a crazy thing for a woman to be put through in biblical times, to be forced to miscarry a child, knowing that if they do, they're going to be put to death. Okay, so, so, like, so how do yeah. I, how talk yeah. to me now so, if I'm if I'm an abortion if I'm pro-choice, how do I look at that and not say well how do you not include that in your belief system yeah. and in your laws and how we should look at this stuff? Well, first of all, they weren't put to death; they were just unable to have children. So that's that's not exactly accurate. They did not put her to death; they just she wasn't allowed to. It doesn't say anything about being that being sentenced to death or that the sentence that could be passage. death. Not in that passage. It, it says she, if she is guilty, she will um, not be able to have children. And people often use that chapter to try to justify abortion from a biblical standpoint. Um, but there's nothing about that in there. And I, I understand this well, is not, a tough Not passage. to justify it, but just to say, like, um, like the exceptions for rape and incest. Like, I'm blown away that that's even on the table that that, that wouldn't even be an exception but it, in some states, they're trying to push to get that even removed as an option for women. And like, when I look at that passage of the Bible, I'm like, well, there was clearly an exception to this back in the day, and it was adultery. It wasn't rape or incest. Is if she was an adulterer, then the aborted fetus was then it was proper to go through this procedure because that was the right thing. In no, that no, no, it didn't. It didn't kill any child. There was no. That there's there's no killing of a of a living child in Numbers five. That's not that's not what happens in in Numbers five. The, the is woman isn't preg she's not pregnant when she goes to drink this. That that's that's not in the chapter. What happens is she's suspected of adultery, 
right. and there's she's not pregnant and then she drinks this formula and i'm not saying that we should do this today by the way i'm no, no, saying no, I, we take the general equity and we apply it today because we live in a different time and um for in this time specifically that allowed the woman to be exonerated from and and dispelled any um strife in the family and so as women, long as she wasn't pregnant yes but and, and as long as she didn't commit adultery yes and if she committed adultery then there were consequences for that in that day and one and, of which uh, one of which would be a miscarriage you have, you no know, you couldn't have children not a miscarriage well, but what what was the point of the herbal cocktail so that you your your room was barren after that but there was no there was no child in the womb before that it just meant that you could not have children going forward i'm gen i will say i'm genuinely confused as to what the semantic difference there is like a miscarriage is when there's a life and no i know what a life. miscarriage i know what it was, I, yeah. but i'm saying like the the agency of the state to force a woman to be barren is also troublesome am i wrong yeah, I, <laughs> Yeah, if, if you that's if crazy, you just, <laughs> if you just read it like that and say we should do this today, I would agree. But I wouldn't say that's what we should do today. Um, now, how exactly we should apply the general equity of this passage today, um, there's many different ways you could go about it. Um, one, one, uh, one way is I actually don't know, I wouldn't feel comfortable or confident giving the general equity of this passage mm -hmm. for today and say, well, this is what we should exactly what we should do today based off this chapter. But I can say looking at this, their society, then this was beneficial for the woman because she could be exonerated and not, and not thought of as an adulterer if she was innocent. And um, I, I, I'm not going to, again, argue that we should do a process like this today in any way, but I, I don't understand saying that this is the same thing as rape or incest, because when there's rape or incest, there's a life that already exists, and then it is taken or killed or dies, and well, in this situation, it prevents from conception going forward. It's completely well, that's, different. Well, I mean, but also, in terms, I think a lot of the argument that why I am just to state my position hundred percent mm -hmm. clearly why I'm pro choice. Um, I'm not pro abortion and I don't know anybody who's pro abortion. <laughs> like, like, like he wakes up every day and is like, yes, like that's, I know, I know people that are pro abortion and that's fine. I don't, yeah. um, I know people who are pro choice and pro access to cho that, that agency. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the choice again, to what? It, a choice to deal with their body and what's happening inside of it, how they, how they believe morally they want to deal with it. Um, what is happening inside of the body? Well, there's, I mean, up until the baby's born, there's a baby growing inside their body from okay. a bundle of cells, one cell right. to four cells to eight so cells. There's a, so there's a baby. There's, there's a lot. Right. Right. What I'm saying here, though, is that the argument I'm hearing from women is that what they're afraid of is agency and Yes, while 2,000 years ago, she may have been exonerated and that was a tiny bit of agency, the thing she had to give up for that exoneration was the ability to have a child forever. Even if she wasn't pregnant, if she was pregnant, that baby is going to be miscarried. If she's not pregnant, she's not able to have children moving forward. So yeah, you were exonerated, but you also got punished. And, yeah. th and, and I think how the fear from the left or from women and from men too, for me, is how this translates into legislation. And when the Supreme Court starts to sort of cherry pick what it is they believe, um, Clarence Thomas, for example, starting to say, well, we're gonna go back and look at contraception and we're gonna look at gay marriage. It's like, fine, but you know what else you need to look at? Interracial marriage. That wasn't legal till 1967, Clarence, and you're married to a white woman. So don't cherry pick. And so. On the left, <laughs> I'm left here sitting here thinking like, Jesus, if the, if the Supreme Court is going to cherry pick their own precedents to go back and revisit, if the religious right is going to cherry pick stuff and always have an excuse for these moments that come up, not saying you're having an excuse, but like, sure. 
that agency, I can understand why women are terrified right now. This slippery slope of like, mm -hmm. is it going to get like, I'm, I could get shit for this from the right or the left, but when I walk by a CVS, I buy plan B now because my wife's in a church. It's a place of refuge. People, random people show up here and need help and ask for help. Jesus did not pick and choose who he took care of when he walked around. He didn't say, are you a follower? He helped. And so my, my wife's version interpretation of the Bible is one of like, I'm not pro-abortion, but I got to help. And, I'm, and now when Clarence Thomas comes out and says what I'm doing might be illegal in five years if he has his way, you, I, what I want is just an acknowledgement from the right that like, that, that's a slippery slope, man. And, and I would love what I want to see. I would love for the Supreme Court, I would love to feel like the Supreme Court and the religious right would back up a football coach who was Muslim, who wanted to throw his prayer rug out on the 50 yard line at the end of every game based on the, my evidence and the data I have in front of me and my lived experience, that wouldn't happen. And I'll bet, given your lived experience, you would probably partially agree with me that just whether or not you want that to happen, it just, it wouldn't go down the same way. That yeah. freaks me the fuck out, man. And how, and like, if we want to live in a society where religious beliefs are codified into legislation, we also need to be okay with an atheist being president someday or somebody who's agnostic who doesn't give a crap what the Old Testament says and is only going to look at what's happening right in front of them and make the best mor the moral decision they can make. And I guess, I guess that's the fear. That's the, that's the worry I have as yeah. somebody who so, lives in a church and believes in religion and all the things. It's uh -huh, like, I don't, uh -huh. want, I don't want a pastor being the, being the president. So uh, just a few things. Um, one is just want to comment on you saying when I, well, what I hear from women, right? Mm -hmm. There's this idea of like, you know, not all women to be clear. just to say that out loud. Like it's not right. all, like, that's all. sort of my point is people often talk to me and, and say, well, you're a man. How can you be talking about this? Why don't you listen to women? I'm like, well, I do. I listen to my sister and my mom and my many women friends who are pro-life, like just as much as not more than me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's not one woman's perspective and many women are afraid of um, kill, of the killing of the young in this, in this nation. And I would also say that the only true pro women stance is a pro-life stance because there's women in the womb that are being dismembered, that are being born, uh, burned alive, um, that are having their brains suctioned out of their head, that are having the babies come out halfway and then they kill them while, while they're alive outside of the womb, the partial birth abortion. I think there's plenty of women who are more concerned about that. Um, and so I want to say that, and then going on to um, the picking and choosing and having, you know, an atheist president, um, this is where we're going to get into some deeper, uh, some, a deeper disagreement because my view is this. Yes. I pick and choose from the old testament i absolutely do i have reasons for pick for what i pick and choose mm -hmm. biblical reasons and is is my view perfect no it needs to be improved even with that numbers five passage i wish i had a better explanation i wish i had better things to say oops than what i than what i did say but for people who reject the bible they are also picking and choosing from the bible because in you know Leviticus, there's plenty of or Exodus. There's you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not covet, um, honor your father and mother. These are things that an atheist accepts as moral. Yet they deny many of the other things taught in the Old Testament, and so they are also picking and choosing. And then you might say, oh, well, they're not getting that from the Bible. They're getting that from their own personal experience. And I would say, well, whether you like it or not, the society that we live in and the West as a whole has been founded on the Bible. And these truths have been taught down from a biblical perspective. The whole idea of individual rights as a concept is a biblical concept. And the whole idea of innocent until proven guilty is a biblical concept. And without the Bible, you have no basis 
for saying that we should do those things in the first place. And so even atheists are taking from the Bible and saying, yes, we should do this, this, and this, and this is what our society is built on, but I'm going to not do this, this, and this. The only difference is I have reasons for picking and choosing what I'm picking and choosing based on the Bible. And atheists and people who reject the Bible are, they don't even know that they're picking and choosing. They're just assuming that they're this moral agent who knows right from wrong and that they're the beginning and the end of morality. And what I'm saying is I trust God for morality. I don't trust myself for morality. I don't trust man for morality. I trust the word of the living God. And without that, you have a void, you have nothing, and you can basically justify any law. And so I'm not saying that we should have, that we should force top-down religion in this country. I don't believe in that. Um, I don't believe in a crusade style approach Mm -hmm. to enforcing uh, Christian beliefs in this country. What I believe, what I believe in is the gospel and spreading the gospel. And because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, it's the, it's the power to change people's hearts towards the Bible and towards Christ. And I'm for bottom up change from that. Like I'm, I'm personally very happy about the Roe v. Wade decision, but it, it mean and it means that millions of babies of lives will, will be saved but what i really think needs to happen is a bottom up cultural change and the people need to change first and so i'm going to advocate for for biblical laws sure i'm going to advocate for what i think is right but i'm not going to force that upon anyone unless they're trying to take someone else's life or oppress minorities or you know do uh, take take uh, and infringe on people's individual rights um obviously someone would say well abortion is an individual right and i would say you're ignoring the individual right of the baby and so you're saying well, let me ask you right well, for abortion but the um uh, two two things sorry that One, was a lot no no no, it's fine um do you uh, and unfortunately i have a i have another appointment at 11 30 but uh, okay. i think what we can we can pick up a part two at some other sure. point. um i would I have I had a very paternalistic reaction to what you were saying about society in which we live being based on uh, the Bible. Um, I think I take I don't disagree with you that that a lot of morality stances and the way people see the world now doesn't have some influence from the Bible. I also I think we got to be careful not to assume that morality started with Jesus. There have been Native Americans in this country for twelve thousand years. There have been the Mayans, like the Romans, like all, and, and not to say that everybody's morality was perfect. Um, those systems also infiltrated our society in ways that are hard to really tease out and understand exactly 100% of why they happen. Um, I think I would just, I would take issue with the idea that, that again, I think this is where it comes to theocracy. I, Yes, morality does come from the Bible. It also comes from the Quran. It also comes from indigenous teachings from 10,000 years ago. It comes from oral histories passed down from African tribes from for 30,000, you know. And so I just want us to be careful here that like, or just acknowledge that that's a fear people have when we start saying that, well, this is where it started. I think the founders of the constitution, yes, while they may have mostly been Christian, went out of their way to keep the word Christian out of the Constitution. Like, if they were so brilliant and really believed that what they were doing as a Christian man was the foundation, then they would have put it in there, if we think they're so brilliant, you know? And so that's... Well, that's. Go ahead, sorry. You mind if I pick you up on that yet? So I think a lot of times people might hear what I'm saying and think that I'm saying that you can't be a good person if you're not a Christian or you can't have a, a solid moral compass if you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. I'm more saying, what's your justification for being moral? And so if someone is an atheist and is a is a moral a more moral person than many Christians or so-called Christians in this nation, um, I would say, okay, that's, that's great. I celebrate that. But then I would ask what, why, what is your justification? If this is just a meaningless universe and we were all just stardust and it's going to end and there's going to be nothing, what is your justification for living morally? And so you can point to all these different groups 
that have their own moral systems. And sure, they have influenced our cultures in some ways, but I would say you still need a standard or a standard or an objective moral basis to justify it being moral. You can't just say, well, some people did it this way. Some people did it this way. I'm going to pick and choose this. It's, it's, uh, if you don't have that justification, that standard of moral good and of moral right and wrong, which is God, then you ultimately have no justification. I keep saying that word because that's like what I'm really talking about. Again, I'm not talking about being moral. I'm talking about having a, a justification or a reason to be moral. And I don't see that anywhere except for um, the Bible. And obviously some, some people would say that the Quran is their standard. And I would say, okay, let's have a discussion about that, you know, and then we would go down that road, but you need an objective moral, moral basis. That's why you have all these existential philosophers in the 20th century, like Camus saying the only real philosophical question is whether or not you should kill yourself or not, because some argue that the fundamental characteristic of life is suffering. And so if that's true, and if there's no afterlife, why go on? Right. And why, and that's a really good question. Why go on if there's no objective right and wrong, if there's no inherent meaning to life. And so, um, it, yeah, does that, no, does yeah, that no, I, I, I understand why I, I totally understand why you, why you feel that way. And I respect it. Um, I would say I, d I don't, again, I, th I think I would be careful personally about the objective moral standard or saying something should, a moral standard should be objective. And I'm, I'm already sort of, I know moral subjectivity is also troublesome um, and can get you into some sticky wickets. Um, slavery was morally acceptable in the Bible in parts. Oh, well, that's, a, do you want to go there? Um, not in the time. I don't know that we have the time to go down that route, okay. but what, uh, I'm fully it, equipped it, to handle that in terms of, per, I'm just saying in terms of perception. Yeah. Um, I think I, I, I the that's reason where we I'm get to reading it in context, right? That's where right. context is absolutely necessary because it's this not is, slavery in the same way as we think of slavery. But to me, I think this goes back to a little bit of what I, why I asked you, like, what do you feel is hurting your argument? Um, and why this argument still exists in the way it does. Um, I think I mentioned to you there's a there's a great podcast with Ben Shapiro and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and I think it's on Ben's podcast and I yeah. you know I don't politically align myself with Ben Shapiro and I'll listen to one of his podcasts every so often just to be like what are people thinking over there you know and yeah, that's smart um, that's smart he drives me crazy in many respects and I think he, I hate the where he puts his ads in his stuff like he gets into yeah. something and he's just like and let's buy a certain mattress yeah. I'm like Jesus Christ yeah. bro like <laughs> Um, but when Neil deGrasse Tyson agreed to go on his podcast, I thought, okay, I really do genuinely adore Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, because he has a deep respect for religion, but a healthy distrust of the way it is enacted oftentimes and how it butts up against scientific belief and all that stuff. Um, it was an amazing conversation. I really recommend, I'll, if I can find it, I'll send it to you. And I think everybody who is skeptical of religion and loves science or vice versa, skeptical of science and loves religion like needs to listen to it because it's a it's a conversation very similar to this nobody's screaming or yelling people mm -hmm. definitely have clear viewpoints um i also recommend people listen to sam harris he's somebody i don't agree with all the time um but he's an atheist and he's a philosopher he's a meditator like um he also has I, again he, he'll go down tangents that i don't agree with hey, i think he has major blind spots but he talks a lot about this idea of like that morality is something that has been in our bones and in our DNA for hundreds of thousands of years. And we, yeah. are, we are constantly trying to update it. Um, I think we should do a part two because unfortunately I have to go and I hate leaving. I, we didn't solve anything today. Yeah. Um, what I hope people took away from this was um, a respect for each other that you and I have. And if we saw each other and we were, you know, I'd be happy to come in and like, if you're playing a marimba piece and like you wanted thoughts on it, like I wouldn't be like, well, you believe in abortion. Yeah. Or, you know, I like, no, like I'm, yeah. I'm a big boy. Um, what Same I, here. and I hope that I will continue to have these conversations to make my argument better because you know, I'm aware when I say things like I, I don't, I'm not a biblical scholar. I haven't thought about this stuff. Even as I'd love for you to talk to my wife because you and I her freaking go, forgot the irresistible grace in my own <laughs> viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> but I think 
I think actually the nut of this and why I want to talk to you is because not that I want my mind changed. I want to, be, I want to sharpen my axe. I want to make sure that what I think and why I'm trying to think it and why I still think it tomorrow and why I still think it next Thursday is what I said today. And if that changes, it is incumbent upon me to be like, you know what? I've changed my... Yeah, I will say something that changed the way I see things um, I used to go crazy about gun violence, and I still do. It drives me bonkers. I would be like 35,000 people shot every year. 25,000 of those are suicides. We've yeah. got to do something about this. Somebody asked me how many abortions would happen a year, and I was just like, I don't know, 30,000. It's, six, it's almost almost 682,000 last year. Like, now, there's a it's, million it's reasons... There's it's a, a million, lot more than that a lot of years as well. But, like there's been 63 million abortions since 1973. So, but yeah. while I still hold my viewpoint of, of choice and access to medical care for, for women involved with this and more accountability for the men involved with this, uh, these situations, like that gives me a little bit of a pause. I have to go back and sharpen my ax a little bit more than I did prior to knowing that piece of data. So I hope in that respect, I hope you do the same. That when you when you talk to somebody who makes you go like, uh oh, like sit with that uh oh for longer than you want to, because it's really yeah. helped me. It's it's what opened the door, I think, to have a conversation with you. Is I want to sit with that uh oh for a minute. Yeah. Um, and and on that note, man, I, I'll give you the last word here, just because it's you know you've been so gracious and, and generous with your time here. Um, I just want to say thank you for your time here and. Uh, if anybody is upset by anything that we talked about or that you talked about, you absolutely have the right to reach out to me or you, and we can have this conversation. And I will give you the platform and the space just like I gave you, David. Um, and so, I, and moving forward, I trust that you'll, you'll do this with people who disagree with you moving forward. And that's all I ask. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'll give you the last word here, buddy, and, and, um, we'll, and yeah. we'll wrap it up. Well, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate you and this conversation. And you being so willing to hear my viewpoints, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who, um, well, I've encountered a lot of people who basically want nothing to do with me after hearing these viewpoints. And so not only do I appreciate it just because you're being respectful, but also because I also think that you're, you're, you're really smart and you have thought about these things a lot and you're passionate and you're the exact type of person that I want to be friends with and that I want to be able to like bounce these ideas off of. And like, like you said, sharpen, sharpen my, my ax as well. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess that that's really, yeah, I, I really do appreciate it, man. And I'd love to do to talk to you again sometime on air or off air. So, yeah. And, and we don't have to talk about these issues either. Like yeah. if there's, if you want to talk, talk about music, about, if you want to talk about music, like my, yeah. I'm, I'm an open door here. And, and again, I, I'm grateful that I never felt in this conversation like there wasn't something I couldn't say to you. And I think that is the thing that scares me the most about society right now. Um, but I think the right, and I, don't, I keep lumping you into the right, I think people on the other side of any argument need to think long and hard about where they're wrong and where their ax is a little rusty. And I think both of us today, we, our axes aren't clean, but I think they're both a little sharper than they were I would say so. So anyway, man, yes. thank you. Thank you for your time. Stay healthy. And um, I'll look forward to chatting with you again soon. You too, friend. See ya. All right. See you, man. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid Drum. Liquiddrum.com down in Waco, Texas. Uh, my good friend Todd Meehan runs an amazing percussion company down there. Great merch. Great content. Check him out. Liquiddrum.com. Also, Kyle Dunleavy, dunleavypans.com, D-U-N-L-E-A-V-Y pans.com. Kyle Dunleavy makes and builds all the steel drums that I perform and teach on, uh, and so percussion, as well as at NYU and Princeton. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing tuner builder, um, just a really nice guy, very dependable. Check him out. If you are interested at all in steel pan advocacy, uh, want to learn more about the goings-on uh, in Pan in Brooklyn? Check out paninmotion.com. My good friend Kendall Williams, uh, Jerry Guy, Trisha Guy, and uh, Arisha John run an amazing organization called paninmotion.com. Check them out. And finally, Aliandre Mirage runs an amazing uh, clothing apparel company in Brooklyn that is steel pan-centric. You can check him out at mangochowclothing.com. I own a bunch of his shirts. They're amazing, very stylish, uh, beautiful, beautifully made. Check them out. MangoChowClothing.com. Okay, hope you're well. Talk to you soon.
拜。